Hello everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Camille. I am a first year medical student as well as a registered nurse. And today's video is going to be all about using contrast and in interventional radiology. So without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking all about using contrast and in interventional radiology. So our first question, what exactly is contrast? So contrast is also sometimes referred to as dye, um, and what it does is it helps us illuminate and better understand what is occurring in a certain portion of the vasculature across the body. Contrast can be used in both venous and arterial instances um, to help highlight different pathologies that may be occurring in that area. Some common pathologies that we use contrast dye to look for um, include hemorrhaging, so bleeding into an area, and or some kind of occlusion, right? So it is used for many of our procedures. Um, roughly, I would say 90% of our vascular procedures will use some form of contrast to help us understand better what's going on and how to fix that issue that the patient's having. Likewise, there are some precautions that need to be taken whenever using contrast in interventional radiology. These include checking if the patient has an allergy to contrast. If so, what is the reaction? Um, and we also will go more in depth on contrast allergies later in this presentation. Um, moving on, we do have to verify the patient's kidney functioning. If they do have a history of any chronic kidney disease, if the patient's on dialysis, um, history of kidney transplant or acute kidney injury, these are all um, deterrents from using contrast. And therefore we look at two blood tests specifically including uh, creatinine and GFR to determine um, the patient's kidney function. So contrast is filtered out through the kidneys. That is why it's so important to keep kidney function in mind, um, especially when using in high-risk populations. Um, we also will discuss this a little bit more later on, but there's also a consideration for pre and post hydration. Um, so IV fluids for patients that are at higher risk um, before and after giving them IV contrast. Moving on, um, there are different types of contrast agents that we use, including positive and negative contrast agents. A positive contrast agent um, includes iodine and gadolinium-based contrasts. Um, they are denser than the patient's tissue, therefore absorb more x-ray and appear darker. Um, the most commonly used is iodine-based, such as Visipake or Omnipake. Um, gadolinium is an option, however, it is expensive and it's mainly used in MRI imaging rather than under fluoroscopy, such as we use in IR. Moving on to negative contrast agents, there's only one on the market and one available, that's CO2, so carbon dioxide. It's a gas and it is radiolucent, meaning it does not appear on x-ray. However, there's special um, equipment and technology that is used that basically makes the backdrop darker and everything that's radiolucent, so that white um, light shows up lighter on the imaging, therefore gives us a visualization of the vasculature. Um, more on CO2 is coming up soon here. So CO2 is a gas that's excreted by the lungs, as we know. Um, it does pose a risk of cerebral toxicity. Therefore, it is very important that it's never used in arteries. It's never used above the diaphragm and in any patient that has a left to right heart shunt. Okay, so never use in those cases. It's is only used with DSA, which is digital subtraction and geography. So that's that special equipment, that special software that is used to visualize the CO2 under our fluoroscopy. Um, and again, CO2 is a great alternative for patients with a contrast allergy and or severe renal insufficiency. Um, it does not harm or affect the kidneys as much as the iodine-based contrasts. Um, therefore, it is a good potential option for patients that do have acute kidney injury or some kind of um, renal insufficiency as well. So some people might ask, why is a right to left heart shunt a contraindication for CO2? Um, that is because some of the gas particles can actually cross the septum and go into the arterial system and potentially cause an em embolism or a stroke, um, which is obviously not a good thing. Um, so we want to avoid that at all costs. Now, there is a special filling technique um, when using CO2. So you want to use a closed system, right? So basically, you do not want to introduce any air. Um, you want to have only CO2 in your syringes that are filled with the gas. So usually, um, 
the setup depends on physician preference and also what facility you're at, but basically it's usually two um, 50 cc syringes with a three-way stopcock um, and well, two three-way stopcocks. And basically one is hooked up to the CO2 tank. You allow the CO2 to passively fill the syringes, meaning you're not aspirating back on the syringe to fill it. Rather, you're just letting the gas fill the syringe by that pressure that it's building up. Um, likewise, you do purges, right? So you fill that syringe up first, you turn your three-way stopcock, you push that gas into your second syringe and then you push that gas out into the air and then you fill that system a couple of times. What this does is it purges all of the air out of that system and therefore the lines and syringes both only contain CO2 then, right? Um, this again is very important. You don't wanna be injecting air into a patient's body. Um, the CO2 will get absorbed by the patient's vasculature um, and therefore used venously should not cause any issues, right? Um, and then a last very key note is never hook the tank, so the CO2 tank, up directly to the patient. Always use that filling system that I explained. Okay, so moving on to some more contrast precautions. We roughly um, discussed this earlier, but I wanted to go a little bit more in depth with you guys. Um, so renal insufficiency, again, any patient that has some kind of uh, kidney issue, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, on dialysis, kidney transplant of the sort, um, you should always consider diluting the contrast. So we will still use contrast in patients with kidney issues um, if they are mild and they can tolerate it, right? So really it comes down to patient presentation and also the um, need for the procedure, right? So if a patient is um, hemorrhaging into their stomach, for example, or their abdomen, um, we will be more likely to use the contrast dye rather than not using any dye at all, since if we don't stop the bleeding, the patient will die, right? So um, one thing we will do, though, however, is dilute the contrast, right? Most procedures, regardless of patient's kidney status, we will use diluted contrast um, just because it gets you good imaging with using less dye. So the dilution depends on the physician preference, but usually what I've seen is 80-20, meaning 80% contrast, 20% saline in your syringe, or 50-50, meaning 50% contrast and 50% saline. Um, likewise, IV fluid should be considered before and after. We call this hydration therapy. Really what it's supposed to do is help flush out the kidneys, um, help get all that contrast dye out of the system faster. Um, moving on into some allergies, right? So if they have a known allergy, um, obviously you always ask what the reaction is, right? Um, and then you want to premedicate that patient. Depending on the severity of the allergy will depend on what um, regimen you might use for that contrast reaction. Um, and then one just side note that is kind of controversial. Uh, research studies are still on the fence about it, but there is cross sensitivity with contrast allergies and shellfish and strawberry allergies. Um, again, there has been some evidence to show that this is true. However, um, it is not a 100% rule of thumb and that is still up for debate. Okay, so a patient presents with a contrast allergy, what can we do, right? So allergy premedication is always an option. Um, note that these two regimens are what I'm used to and what my um, facility that I work at um, goes by. However, it can vary based on physician preferences, the facility you work at. So this is just a rough um, example of what I'm familiar with, but do not take this as um, this is what everyone should do or you should do. So um, a lot of the times, again, it's based on patient allergy severity. So if someone comes in and says, hey, you know, I have anaphylaxis whenever I receive contrast, there will be a much more thorough regimen versus someone that says, well, you know, I just get a little bit itchy. Um, from the contrast dye itself, or I just feel very warm afterwards or something of that nature. So that will really determine um, what premedication regimen we should use. So um, two of them here, um, prednisone 50 milligrams by mouth at 13 hours, seven hours, and one hour before the injection, plus Benadryl 50 milligrams IV one hour before the contrast medium. So that's one of them, or you can do the Salumedrol 32 milligrams by mouth, 12 hours, two hours, uh, before contrast injection or 125 IV push pre-procedurally, um, as well as an antihistamine can be added, such as Benadryl um, as well. So also um, one thing to note is that there's also what's called emergency prep. 
So let's say you don't have time for the 13 hours or the 12 hours or whatever. Um, some proceduralists um, may order a one-time dose of Benadryl as well as a one-time dose of Salumedrol 125 immediately pre-procedurally and then just obviously closely monitor them during the procedure and afterwards, especially in emergent cases, right? Such as, you know, something that can't wait, a GI bleed, um, pulmonary embolism, and or stroke are some examples. So moving on, managing a contrast reaction. So let's say, you know, someone comes in, doesn't say anything, they have a contrast allergy or they don't even know this is the first time they're getting contrast. Um, how do you manage it if they do end up um, reacting, right? So typically contrast reactions occur within the first 20 minutes. Common reactions that are pretty mild include uticardia, so that's itching, a metallic taste in the mouth, and some mild nausea and sneezing. So really treatment here, it's either no treatment, so it'll go away on its own, um, or you can do IV Benadryl um, or IV Zofran, right? So IV Benadryl can help with the itching um, and then the um, itching and sneezing, and then the uh, Zofran can help with any nausea or potentially vomiting, right? Um, however, again, these are very mild and usually go away on their own, even if you do not treat them. I will say anytime I do see a reaction, I still treat it with at least Benadryl. Um, it, can't help, it can't hurt them um, and it can only help them really. Um, Moving on to some severe reactions, so that includes anaphylaxis, um, arrhythmias, pulmonary embolism, and or sorry, pulmonary edema, and or circulatory collapse. So really what the treatment is, is IV push epinephrine and or initiate your code blue protocol or your rapid response team at that point in time, especially if the patient is quickly decompensating. I'm always one to err on the side of caution um, and bring in more people to help. Um, rather get it, I rather get it, you know, under the situation under control earlier than wait and then have to code a patient, unfortunately. Um, again, severe reactions are very rare um, and they usually occur um, in one of 3,000 patients on average. Um, not to say that they can never happen, but um, it is very infrequent. However, it is still good to know, especially in your practice, um, how to treat or manage some reactions. Okay, so we're just going to overview kind of what we discussed today. So what is contrast? It helps us illuminate vasculature to visualize underlying pathologies. There is both positive and contrast agents that can be used. Um, Iodine-based are the most commonly um, used. However, um, there is also special precautions that are necessary whenever you are using CO2, which is a negative contrast agent and the only contrast agent on the market. Um, moreover, you need to consider patient allergies and renal function prior to using any contrast. And then if patients do have a history of contrast allergies, make sure you have pre-medication on board prior to the procedure and using contrast dye. Likewise, you should always be prepared to manage and control an associated allergic reaction due to contrast. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and don't forget to subscribe to this channel. I am hoping to make more videos like this in the future. Again, just detailing a little bit more about what we do in IR, some educational information, as well as going through some case reviews um, and different procedures that we do. I'm hoping this channel will provide a resource for me to both share my story as well as share my knowledge and experiences in interventional radiology with anyone who is interested, whether that be from a nursing perspective, a physician perspective, residents, medical students, or people just interested in learning more about interventional radiology. All right, again, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.